Hello there, everybody. Good morning to you. My weekend was good, Daniel. Thanks for asking. Um, restful. Yesterday, basically spent the whole day just kind of resting and taking a low-key day. Hello there, good morning. I do. <laughs> I actually teach on Saturdays too. So, um, Saturday mornings from 8 until 11, I teach a college class on Saturdays as well. And then I'm doing my, um, so on the side, um, like in my free time, um, I'm not like, I'm not married. I don't have kids or anything like that. And so, um, I, in my free time to indulge in more creative outlets, I actually, um, I make music. I'm a music producer. And, um, so I, I make music with a friend of mine named Henry. And um, so Henry came over, we produced some stuff um, on Saturday. And um, so yeah, it's like, yeah, it's a recursive resonance. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So like Saturday was spent working all day because I mean, I love working on music, but it's nonetheless, you know, you're still working. Um, and so, and I do it on, so, Tuesday nights, Thursday nights, and Saturdays, I devote my evenings and my day to, to working on recursive stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, really my time is very delicately budgeted, budgeted out to a bunch of things. But yeah, Recursive Resonance is the name of my little music side group that I do for creative outlet purposes, and uh, it's a lot of fun. So We're, we're in talks with... Um, some film producers right now in Los Angeles about creating a, basically a, a five minute cinematic to go along with one of our videos uh, or songs that are coming out rather that uh, we haven't released this song yet but it's been done for about a week or two and we're just uh, kind of making decisions about how we want to go about that and then we're making another one right now and um, the next big thing for recursive is we're putting together a live set and we're going to do like a a, a distance concert basically so we're going to do a live show where we play our music live and um, and it'll be cool so it's just like something fun to do you know creative well I guess we should get started here um, let's uh, well let's um, jump over to the desktop and I'm going to make some adjustments here on my screen so that we can see what's going on. Good morning to you, everybody, to, that is saying hello in the, uh, in the chat over here. And I'm going to open up the PowerPoint, which is right here. And I'm actually going to uh, pause the video. Close that, and then we'll bring this back down to where we left off, talking a little bit about some things. So last class, we really left off right here. I mean, I didn't show, I just had the camera on me last time talking to you guys um, about uh, the story of, essentially the story of how the Church of England got formed we really spent the vast majority of the last class that we had together on Thursday talking about the establishment of the Church of England. And we talked about the change in um, rulers of England uh, from Henry VII to Henry VIII, who was the one who had six wives, uh, to his son, Edward. In fact, we, just to go back here and recount a little bit about what we talked about, all right, um, these are the six wives that Henry VIII had. 
So Catherine of Aragon, um, Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, and then um, I think it's the fourth one is Catherine Parr. Is that right? No, Anne of Cleves. Anne of Cleves is the fourth one. He got divorced. He was only married to her for a short time. And then uh, Catherine Howard and then Catherine Parr. Three of his wives' name were Catherine, two of them were Anne, and one of them was Jane. So that's kind of unusual too. But Catherine Parr was his last wife, and he's, she's the one that outlives him, okay? And that's her down here. All right, so one, two, three, four, five, six. And um, he does have a son with Jane Seymour, but remember Jane Seymour dies in childbirth. And so um, anyhow, we also talked about this dude, uh, Thomas Cranmer, who replaced Thomas Wolsey after he failed from coming back from the Pope to secure the divorce. Thomas Cranmer is the one who convinces Henry to break away from Rome and establish the Anglican Church. When he does that, he also, Henry VIII, passes the Act of Succession, which in 1534, all the king's subjects had to take an oath of, of loyalty to the king as head of the Anglican Church. And because there was a famous writer by the name of Thomas More, he was one of those northern humanists we learned about in the first unit, Thomas More ended up getting executed by Henry VIII uh, for refusing to take the oath of the Act of Succession. Also, because Henry VIII closed down the monasteries in Northern Europe, and because of some other political economical things that were going on up in Northern Europe that had been ignored by the king for a while, they, when he shut down the monasteries, Catholics in the north of England protested against the king in what became known as the Pilgrimage of Grace, which was as much fueled by religious discontent as it was uh, political reasons. But nonetheless, this Pilgrimage of Grace is put down by the king and the ringleaders of it, including this guy, Robert Ask, uh, uh, were all executed. Also, uh, Henry VIII passed the Statute of the Six Articles, which said that the Anglican Church uh, would retain the most of the Catholic doctrines, uh, like, for example, the Seven Sacraments, celibacy for the clergy, and transubstantiation, despite its independence from Rome. So when we take a look at the, the Catholic Church, it's about or excuse me, when we take a look at the Anglican Church, the Church of England, all right, uh, it's about as close in practice as you can get to Protestant, or excuse me, to Catholicism, okay? So, um, but it nonetheless does change English attitudes forever towards Catholicism. Um, Henry does have one son, okay? It was his youngest child, but because he was a male, he ends up taking the throne first. And um, his son, Edward VI, was only 10 years old when he became king, and that's too young to rule. So his regents that were, a regent is, we're going to use that word several times today, a regent is just somebody who's put in charge until the king comes of age to actually take power himself. But when you're under age, even though you're, you're the rightful heir, you have a regent. And England became more Protestant during his reign because of these regents being very heavily Protestant and faithful to the king's practices, uh, King Henry VIII's practices. New practices of them during this time is that clergy could marry, iconic images were removed from churches, uh, communion by the laity was expanded. Also, there's some new doctrines, salvation by faith alone. They're, they're starting to bring in more Protestant, um, more Lutheran-style Protestant practices only two sacraments, baptism and communion. So it's becoming a little bit more, under Edward VI's time, a little bit more Lutheran in its, in its practice, the Anglican Church is. But he dies prematurely. Um, Edward VI was never a very healthy child. And I believe he ends up dying of tuberculosis by the time that he turns like 17 or something like that. Um, and this led to a religious struggle among Protestants and Catholics. And, um, you know, the next in line was his older half-sister, Mary. And we talked about Mary. She was the one who sometimes gets nicknamed Bloody Mary because of her unsuccessful attempt to reinstate Catholicism in England. And by the time that she becomes queen in 1553, R means reigned. She wasn't only five, okay? She was an adult, an adult but she doesn't come to rule England until 1553. And during her rule, she tries to reinstate Catholicism by executing about 300 people, even including Archbishop Cranmer, the guy who 
had originally convinced Henry VIII to break away from the Catholic Church in the first place. Um, during her reign, a number of different Anglicans fled England. They were known as Marian exiles because they feared their own death, their own persecution. Uh, Mary started rescinding the reformation of legis uh, legislation of Henry's and Edward, Edward's reign. Um, and, and she was actually married to the Catholic King of Spain, all right, who was the future heir to the Spanish throne and, um, and became King of Spain. And so, you know, she, she was trying to reinstate Catholicism. She thought it was her Catholic duty to reinstate Catholicism in England and once again to create that Catholic alliance between England and Spain that Henry VII had attempted to create about 60 years earlier. But she doesn't live because she dies of stomach cancer. And <clears throat> ultimately at that time, Elizabeth I takes over. And that was uh, the last of the Tudor monarchs. She is the only surviving heir of Henry VIII. She was the daughter of Anne Boleyn. Remember that Mary was the daughter of Catherine of Aragon, his first wife. Anne Boleyn was um, his second wife. And Elizabeth gets known as the Virgin Queen because she never married and she never had any children. And, um, you know, the reason that Virginia, the colony of Virginia, gets its name is because it is in part named after the Virgin Queen, Elizabeth I, who initiated English exploration into the New World um, unsuccessfully, but then afterwards um, under James I, who ends up taking over as King of England after Elizabeth dies in 1603. Um, uh, she, you know, the, there's still a lot of um, fond memories of Elizabeth, who is really one of the greatest European monarchs of all time, not just English monarchs, but European monarchs. Um, she was the daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, like I said. Remember, Anne Boleyn had a little bit more Protestant inclinations, as did Henry VIII, and so she is strongly Protestant. Catholics in the beginning of her reign saw her as an illegitimate child because um, she was born out of wedlock, um, or she was conceived out of wedlock. She was born after being married, uh, uh, after Henry and Anne became married, but they were married in the Anglican Church, and so some Catholics didn't recognize her as legitimate, and she held these strongly Protestant views, like her mother. Um, but she very effectively oversaw the development of Protestantism in England, she was a politique, and a politique is a term, again, that we're going to use a lot this class, which is a, you know, a practical and really brilliant politician who is able to carefully navigate a middle ground between this religious conflict going on in England, and, and there are other politiques in other areas of Europe as well, um, that are able to kind of deftly navigate. The, they have a lot of political acumen. They're not too extremist in their religion view, religious views, and they're able to kind of... Um, uh, navigate a middle ground between all of these religious conflicts and prevent uprisings and indeed even prevent their own overthrow as a product of religious upheaval. So um, Puritans uh, are starting to emerge in England at this time. Puritans are English Calvinists who were looking to reform the Anglican Church. Um, Puritans wanted to purify, if you will, the Anglican Church and take away some of its more Catholic elements. Um, and, and, you know, she doesn't really want the Puritans to gain ground, so she has to navigate, um, you know, this middle ground between Anglicanism, which is more moderate in its faith, and Protestantism, uh, you know, Puritanism, rather, which is, you know, because Anglican is still Protestant, but there are, there are more moderate Protestants and there are more radical Protestants, and in England, the radical Protestants are the ones that they are going to uh, try and subdue, Calvinists, okay? Same in France as well. But uh, the, Fr the French Calvinists are Huguenots. The English Calvinists are Puritans, all right? Um, she also um, negotiated what became known as the Elizabethan Settlement. And what the Elizabethan Settlement was was where basically Elizabeth and Parliament, which are the ruling nobles of England, required conformity to the Church of England, but... Even though people, you know, the Church of England was the official faith of England, um, people were required to swear an oath to the Church of England, but behind closed doors, people were effectively allowed to worship whatever form of Protestantism or Catholicism privately without being, having to worry about being thrown behind bars. As long as you were showing up to church and on the outside pretending to be Anglican, uh, behind closed doors, you could still worship to the Catholic uh, faith or worship to the Puritan faith or whatever without much concern. The Anglican Church 
um, during Elizabeth's reign was very, very similar to Lutheranism. Some of the church practices, including ritual, resembled Catholic practices, though, too. You know, there was a book of common pa- uh, prayer, um, and, uh, you know, services were given in English rather than Latin. Um, the clergy was allowed to marry, which is, again, very Lutheran in practice. The Catholic Church doesn't allow their cl- clergy to marry. Um, but, but generally speaking, they're trying to consolidate the authority of the Anglican Church. But Puritans, remember, they're trying to purify the Anglican Church and take away its Catholic elements. So some elements of Catholicism remain um, at this time, especially among the gentry, which are kind of the lesser nobles. But it, couldn't, it just couldn't be practiced openly. But if you were Catholic behind closed doors, you know, they were kind of willing to turn the other cheek and look the other way. But everyone was required to attend church services of the Anglican Church. And if you didn't show up to church, you would be fined. Um, Monasteries, though, do not get reestablished. So the Catholic monasteries that were closed down by Henry VIII stay closed down under Elizabeth's rule as well. There was also something called the 39 Articles in 1563, which started to define the creed of the Anglican Church. And this followed Protestant doctrine. But it was also vague enough to accommodate for most of the English, except for the radical Puritans, who really wanted drastic changes made to the Anglican Church to make it much, much more um, Puritan in, in, its, um, in its proceedings. Some Catholics unsuccessfully plotted assassination attempts and invasions against Elizabeth I during her reign. She reigned for a long time, nearly 50 years. One of the people who tries to challenge her reign and assassinate her, she instigates a plot against Elizabeth, is Elizabeth's cousin, Mary Stuart. Now, don't get Mary Stuart confused with Elizabeth's older half-sister, who is already dead by this point, Mary I, the Catholic, okay? Mary I, the Catholic queen, she's already dead by this point. Her, uh, Mary, Mary, or excuse me, um, Elizabeth's cousin, Mary Stuart, was also known as Mary Queen of Scots, even though she had been exiled from Scotland years earlier and spent most of her time living in Paris. But, um, but nonetheless, Mary Stuart tries to initiate a plot against the queen to take Queen Elizabeth off the throne. Now, Queen Elizabeth had this um, spy master, which is essentially a, a minister who serves as head of like intrigue and intelligence in the court, and his name was Lord Walsingham. Lord Walsingham met with Mary Stuart and convinced her that he was converting to Catholicism and um, tricked Mary Stuart into uh, revealing her plot to kill the queen. And when Mary Stuart was found out, Walsingham returned to England and told Elizabeth everything because he was very, very loyal to Queen Elizabeth for his whole life. And to remove the threat, Queen Elizabeth agreed to have her own cousin, Mary Stuart, executed in 1587. But she was ambivalent about it, and she wanted everything to go smoothly, quickly, and give uh, Mary Stuart an honorable death. The sad story behind that, which is also pretty gruesome, um, is that it does not go the way that Mary, uh, that Elizabeth wanted. Um, the truth of the matter is really Elizabeth and Mary were not friends. They didn't even really know each other. There's question about whether they ever even met and had a conversation in person in the first place. Um, but it's not like they were childhood friends, even though they're first cousins, you know, which means that re- they're relatively closely related. Um, you know, they weren't like friends. They, they weren't close family or anything like that. And, um, and Mary Stewart, uh, when her execution day comes, Uh, she puts her head down on the chopping block the way that they did executions in those days was by way of a a, you know an executioner who had a large battle axe type weapon and they would behead the person well um, unfortunately uh, the the executioner really bungles the whole thing um, and it turns into a a, just a bloodbath Um, he he doesn't strike her on the right position on the back of the neck and he ends up needing to take two more swings after the first one, so three total swings to actually, you know, decapitate her, and um, and it's it's horrific. Uh, and everyone watching there is gasping; they're throwing up. Uh, Elizabeth stands up and screams, runs out because it's it's just really a gruesome and 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 undignified way to go. Also, Mary Stewart, according to people who witnessed this that day. She had actually snuck, she was in a gown, 
um, and she had snuck her little dog into underneath her gown where she could, you know, she brought her dog out to bring her comfort because she knew that she was going to be executed. And when she, you know, when this happens, the dog kind of scampers out from underneath um, uh, Mary and her, her now lifeless body. And it, the whole thing is just really, really sad and really gruesome. And, um, and, and Elizabeth from that point on really was very, you know, um, second guessing of herself and her decision to execute her own cousin because of just how badly the whole thing went. Um, she was, she confined herself for days. She was really upset about the entire thing. Um, and it was, it was bad. So, but Mary, the reason that we talk about this story is because the significance is because Elizabeth didn't have any kids. Her closest relative was her cousin, Mary Stewart, who had a son. Her son was a kid, was a guy named James and James was the King of Scotland. And so Elizabeth's first cousin's kid, James, ends up being the one that takes over the Kingdom of England after Elizabeth's death in 1603. And, um, and so he, he starts a brand new dynasty known as the Stuart Dynasty because he's of a, he's of a different um, you know, family background. And so after uh, Queen Elizabeth dies, it is James, her first cousin once removed, who ends up taking uh, the, the, the crown of England. Uh, Elizabeth's long and successful reign, as well as her uh, uh, practical uh, abilities to negotiate the religious conflict in Europe uh, at this time, make her one of the greatest European rulers in all of European history, particularly considering she's a woman and the subdued place of women at this time. And in fact, I think that we need to talk a little bit about the Reformation's impact on women. Um, you know, we might think that because the Protestant Reformation was making these changes to the church and, and the church was a really patriarchal system and stuff like that, that women's position in society advanced. But I want to caution you about making too many assumptions about the role of women after Protestantism, because in many cases, Protestantism kind of actually restricts the role of women in society. For example, both Luther and Calvin very much believed in the, in the secular subju subjugation of women. They may have believed that women were spiritually equal and had an equal chance of getting into heaven, but they didn't believe that women's position in society should be advanced to being the equivalent of a man. They didn't believe that women should be entering into uh, traditionally male-held uh, positions in um, business or in um, you know, government or, or whatever. Um, the, and so Luther believed that a woman's proper occupation was in the home as a good wife and a good mother, okay, that, that her job was to take care of the family. And again, that's a really very traditional conservative view of women, not a very progressive one. Um, and again, Calvin believed in the subjugation of women to preserve the moral order of a patriarchal society. So, you know, the Protestants, the Protestant Reformation's effect on women also in some cases actually limited their ability to, to divorce because women were uh, expected to be loyal to their husbands and be proper servants of the household, if you will, raising kids. Um, you know, Protestant churches had, had greater official control over marriage than the Catholic Church did. It was actually more common for women to be able to initiate divorce proceedings within the Catholic Church than it was the Protestant churches. Um, and then two, in the, in the Catholic Church, let's say you were too poor to get officially married in the Catholic Church. What the Catholic Church would do is if you were in a relationship for a long time, um, living as though you were husband and wife and raising a family together and stuff. They called this common law marriages, which meant that you may not have been um, actually officially married within the church, but the Catholic counties and countries would, would still no less recognize that as what was known as a common law marriage. Um, and Catholic governments followed this Protestant example in the long run. Um, one thing that is uh, a somewhat of a, of a benefit to women during the Protestant Reformation, um, as well as men, to be honest with you, is that literacy increased. Um, you know, women were able to read the Bible. This resulted in an increase in women's literacy, also an increase in their children's literacy because it was expected of mothers that they were to teach their children the Bible. They were to teach their children how to read. Um, they, we do see some schools start to be developed for girls. 
Um, in particular, Philip Melanchthon became an important figure in education for girls within the Protestant German states. So Protestant women's position educationally does improve a bit with the um, Protestant Reformation, but it doesn't necessarily carry over into everyday life, right? Women may have been able to read, literacy rates may have been going up, they may have been able to obtain an education if they came from uh, a position in society where they had enough wealth, but um, in general their position comparative to men still remains in a subordinated position. Uh, women's, uh, uh, yeah, well, just marriages in general between uh, men and women uh, which was, of course, the only kind of marriage that was allowed at this time. Um, you know, uh, more modern views of marriage uh, between, you know, homosexual folks and so on have not been um, uh, adopted until very, very recent times. And so, um, you know, at this time, uh, the only marriages that were considered legitimate were between a man and a woman. Uh, and and the, the thing about marriages in, a, in an older time, in the medieval ages, marriages were often very economically based, you know, a lot of upper class people didn't even really have a choice about who they would marry because marriages would be um, arranged by their parents for the purposes of mutual benefit and prestige. And um, as we see the Protestant Reformation break out, marriage does start to become more of a companionate affair, meaning that men and women uh, who were becoming married had, had, you know, it was more of an affair of the heart rather than just an economic affair. Um, so, for example, Martin Luther married. He had a wife named Katharina von Bora, and these were good examples of this view, um, emphasizing the loving relationship between man and wife. Also, the traditional Catholic view on, on marriage and, and relationships between men and women uh, within marriage is that, that um, you know, sex was purely to be used for procreative purposes. Um, but, you know, the, the Protestant view is that, um, that sex was to be an, an, an act that was enjoyed by a husband and wife, not simply to be reduced to an act of procreation. Um, and so, you know, we're starting to see some, some changes in terms of the, the loving relationship between um, a married couple rather than just having it be something that's strictly for the purposes of um, of uh, pr procreation and then also to for economic purposes to improve your own family's position over time by um, you know uh, you know beneficial marriages. Uh, Protestant women, however, overall lost opportunities in church services that many Catholic women pursued. So there weren't nuns, for example, in the Protestant faiths. So women kind of gradually lost rights with the Protestant Reformation to manage their own property. Um, to make legal transactions in their own name. There was a practice known as coverture where women actually lost their individual identity when they got married within the Protestant faiths and that all of the man's, um, uh, I, you know, all of the woman's identity was essentially uh, un undertaken by the, by the father of the household. And um, that's, this left women with very difficult um, <coughs> positions <coughs> in the event that they were, um, in the event that they were, uh, you know, widowed and, and their husband died prematurely, it made it so that, you know, getting, getting rights or, or inheriting property from their husband uh, was very, very difficult. Also made it very difficult for women to divorce um, because women's identity was, was um, covered. That's how coverture gets its name. Their identity became, quote, unquote, covered by their husband and they kind of lost individual uh, rights to be able to conduct legal transactions in their own name. Uh, Catholic women, on the other hand, during the Protestant Reformation, continued to enjoy opportunities in the church through joining religious orders. And, for example, there was a famous nun by the name of Angela Merici uh, who founded what became known as the Ursuline Order of the Nuns in the 1530s, which helped to provide educational and religious training to Catholic women. And this was approved as a religious uh, community by Pope Paul III in 1544. Uh, Marici established a foundation for the future of young girls within the Catholic Church and uh, sought to combat heresy through uh, giving young women uh, Catholic Christian education within the, the Catholic Church. And the Ursuline Order of the Nuns eventually even spread to France and the New World uh, thanks to the settlement of the French and the Spanish in um, in some regions in the New World. And then there was another uh, Catholic woman by the name of Teresa de Avila, who was a major Spanish leader of reform 
uh, for monasteries and convents, and she preached that an individual could have a direct relationship with God through prayer and contemplation, even women could. And again, this is providing more of a position for women to operate within the context of a church education. The um, big idea for the you know for a lot of this unit is that the the Protestant Reformation ends up creating a lot of religious conflict in Europe. There are a number of different wars that are fought in Europe, and um, the last of the major religious wars in Europe is known as the Thirty Years' War. And although I'm not going to talk about the Thirty Years' War today, I would like you to know going into the future about the Thirty Years' War because its significance is that. Um, it, it really is the last time that we see a major continental war break out in Europe as a product of religious pluralism. That is to say that you had Catholics and Protestants of different sorts now who were fighting against one another across Europe during the Thirty Years' War. But as the Thirty Years' War progresses towards the end of it, it kind of moves away from its more religious roots and turns into a much more political, dynastical type war that's less concerned about religion and more concerned about dynastic holdings and the future of the politics of Europe, centralization of states and stuff like that. Um, how does it get started? Well, there was something known as the defenestration of Prague. And if you've never heard that word defenestrate before, literally all it means is to throw someone out a window. So when we talk about the defenestration of Prague, it literally starts by these two guys who get thrown out of a window in Prague. Prague, for those of you that don't know, is to this day the modern day capital of the Czech Republic. Uh, at the time, the Czech Republic didn't exist. Obviously, it was still part of the Holy Roman Empire. The, no, uh, the state that it was a part of was known as Bohemia at that time. And, um, you know, maybe you've ever heard of Bohemian Rhapsody, which is the song by Queen. But anyway, um, Bohemia is in Central Europe, and, and as is uh, the Czech Republic in modern times. And so when we talk about the start of the Thirty Years' War, it does not start in England, it doesn't start in France. It starts in a German state, Bohemia. Um, and it starts in Prague, which is the capital of Bohemia. And um, in, on May 23rd, 1618, protesters of the Catholic Church in, um, in Prague went to Prague's Hradkani Hag Palace, okay, stormed into this council chamber where you had a number of Catholic officials and royal officials who were also Catholic, and they started engaging Catholic officials in a debate, carrying with them a petition about religious uh, plurality in, uh, in Prague. And it was, of course, rejected by the Catholic administrators in Prague. And so these Protestant uh, uh, you know, uh, troublemakers, I guess, if you want to call them that, went in and they got into an argument and they ended up throwing two Catholic royal delegates out the window of this castle. Okay, And this initiates the final religious war in Europe. This defen defenestration of Prague is kind of like the initiating event uh, of the whole war. Kind of in the same way that, for example, um, you know, we say that the, the um, Second World War in Europe started when Hitler invaded Poland or um, you know, the First World War started with the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, right? Um, so this is kind of one of those events like that that's an initiating event. The defenestration of Prague is this initiating event of the Thirty Years' War, which indeed does last 30 years, kind of off and on, um, from 1618 all the way up until 1648. And 1648 is the, the last uh, year where uh, eventually the war ends and it results in something called the Treaty of Westphalia. But as I said, I'll talk more about the Thirty Years' War another day. I'm not going to get into it today with you because it's too long to talk about. Uh, but, but nonetheless, just be aware that it is the last, the final of the religious wars in Europe. And after 1648, we don't see religious pluralism being, being a problem that initiates war between European um, kingdoms anymore. The crowd below was very angry, which was a largely Protestant crowd below, was very angry that no one got killed after being thrown out the window. And, and it depended on who you asked. If you said Catholics, if you asked Catholics, what happened? How come they didn't die? The Catholics would tell you, well, it's of course because angels swooped down to save them, to guide their fall without harming them and taking their lives. And then if you asked Protestants below, how come they didn't die? They would tell you, well, the, they would have died, but the two men ended up falling onto two huge heaps of horse dung. 
And so, um, you know, that's one of those things in history where based on who you asked, you might get a little bit of a different story there. But nonetheless, these two guys are thrown out the window, and although they don't die, um, it still nonetheless initiates this uh, religious conflict in Bohemia. And the, Ref Re the Reformation left a lot of Europe very much randomly divided by religious allegiance. And so you had different places uh, surrounding this area that came in on the side of the Catholics and then other areas that came in on the side of the Protestants. Um, now, much of Germany had been at peace for a while thanks to the Peace of Augsburg, which basically that Qus Regio Eus Religio thing that said that he who reigns, so the religion of that place would be. Uh, but not France. France is really where we need to talk about next in terms of some of this religious upheaval. Remember, this is a full century right here. 1618 is a full century after Martin Luther broke from the church. Okay, Martin Luther was dead by this point. And um, they're still having problems with religious um, conflict in Europe. Uh, but before we get to 1618 and talk about the Thirty Years' War, we really do kind of need to talk a little bit about some things that happened before that in France. So now we're refocusing again uh, to tell the story of France, just like we did last time where we refocused and talked about the story of England. So let's talk about the French Wars of Religion and the Thirty Years' War uh, resulting as a, as a product of some of these problems with France. Basically, you had a bunch of different religious disagreements in France at this time between Catholics and Protestants, and you had dynastic ambitions of princes in both the French and Austrian monarchies. Uh, you know, so there were the, the Bourbons in France and the Habsburgs in Austria, and then right now the Bourbon dynasty isn't even in power yet in France. It's the Valois dynasty who's in power. Uh, in France. But Calvinism started to spread quickly in France. And the French Calvinists, as I said earlier, were known as Huguenots. But uh, the, the English Calvinists, remember, were known as Puritans. So the French Calvinists, the Huguenots, start to spread in France. Um, now, the first guy that we're going to talk about in the story with France today is a king of France at about the same time that Henry VIII of England is king in England. And this guy's name is Francis I of France. And he's part of the Valois dynasty. He's also very Catholic. Uh, Henry VIII and Francis I, in fact, actually even knew one another. They, um, there, was a, uh, there was a giant um, kind of Renaissance festival organized between France and England um, in the early days of Henry VIII's rule. And at this, um, at this giant festival, Henry VIII showed up. And, you know, he's, he's kind of, well, both of these guys are very uh, egotistical. Henry VIII shows up and he challenges the king of France to a wrestling match. And they hold a wrestling match and Henry VIII gets beaten by Francis I in this wrestling Fran uh, match. And um, he ends up spending the rest of this whole uh, Renaissance festival sulking because he's pouting about the fact that he lost this wrestling uh, this wrestling match with, with, with Francis I, which is pretty funny. But anyhow, so they, they knew each other and they were ruling at, at the same time. Francis I ruling in France, Henry VIII ruling in England. And um, Francis I tries to do a number of things during his reign to centralize his power uh, by doing things like taking away some nobles' judicial abilities, um, insisting on his authority to assess and collect taxes, reducing the Catholic Church's authority across France, even though he's Catholic, even though France is largely Catholic at this time, he signed something called the Con Concordat of Bologna in 1516, which established royal control over clergy appointments. So now the king gets to choose who is going to be part of the Catholic Church of France. Also, he would sell offices, positions, and titles that were created by the king. Uh, two nobles in exchange for their loyalty. So now he's starting to sell positions high up in the um, French state to people that he knew would be who would remain loyal to him. And um, the nobles are very resistant of, of some of these um, moves that Francis I is trying to make to centralize his power because the more he centralizes his power, the less these noble, the less power these nobles have. So the nobles are kind of resisting some of these moves because they don't want to see their political power dwindle while the king's power continues to increase. And meanwhile, Calvinism is starting to spread around France, and the peasants start to get squeezed pretty hard for taxes. Now, um, when Francis the, uh, the first of France dies, uh, he, he's king for quite some time in France. He doesn't die until 1547. And by this time, Calvinism's really spreading quite a bit in Europe, including in France. And he was succeeded by his son, Henry II. 
of France. Now remember, Henry II, I thought we were just talking about Henry VIII. Remember, Henry VIII is from England. Okay, so the, that, that Roman numeral designation is dependent upon where the king comes from. So Henry VIII of England, Henry II of France. Okay, so um, to just keep that in mind. And uh, so when he gets succeeded by Henry II, Henry II, um, because of his Catholic tendencies, really attempted to repress the Huguenots. And he, he mistakenly, by repressing the Huguenots and, and killing Huguenots because of their faith, creates some martyrs, meaning that um, these people end up becoming heroes for Huguenot, the Huguenot Calvinist French faith, uh, rather than being silenced for it. And, and so it almost actually has the opposite effect of, of um, you know, uh, you know, what's the word, like, um, you know, making a, making a hero or making a martyr out of people that he was trying to get to um, to stop spreading the faith, and this only kind of reinvigorates some of the Huguenots in France uh, who, who look at these people who get suppressed by the, uh, the king as being religious martyrs. And so, um, you know, he ends up, Henry II also ends up dropping the long war against Spain, partly because, um, you know, France is running out of resources after waging these wars against Spain, but also because Spain was Catholic, and so is France. And so they didn't want to continue, um, you know, the, he's now looking at the issue like, why continue fighting against a foreign Catholic power when we have to be fighting against Protestant domestic issues right here at home in France? And um, so he signed something called the Treaty of Cateau Cam Cambrai C in 1559. And uh, this treaty meant that France agreed to respect Habsburg primacy in Italy and their control over Flanders which is in Belgium. So the Spanish had these lands um, in the Low Countries that, that France was definitely antagonizing. And, um, and these, these places in the Low Countries are like Belgium, Luxembourg, and uh, the Dutch Republic. And the Dutch end up breaking away from Spain uh, in wars in the late 1500s. And um, so anyhow, the, the, these areas just to the northeast, they literally border France, but Spain controlled them. Um, kind of uh, just, you know, just if you look at a map of Europe, uh, the low countries that we call them are really, the reason they're called the low countries is because of their elevation, of their sea level, okay? They're very low elevation. They're not like low in Europe, if you will, in terms of like north-south uh, designation. They're actually in northern Europe where um, you know, the Dutch and the Belgians are. But anyhow, um, Henry II's life gets cut short because he participates in a festival, a Renaissance uh, tournament, a jousting tournament to be precise. So you're on horseback and you have these giant lances. And this lance hits Henry II in exactly the right place where he doesn't have armor on. And it basically skewers him. He's knocked off the horse and he was killed. And so um, Henry II dies in a very unfortunate jousting accident. And at that point, he did have three sons, but they're all just s still children at this time. And um, the person who ends up taking over as the regent, which again is just a, a, um, a term that, that means whoever is looking out for these ch child uh, rulers, Okay, uh, ends up being his widow, Catherine de Medici. Now, Catherine de Medici was this, uh, uh, she was related to the Medici family, of course, from Italy. Um, the French people don't like her because she's seen as a foreigner. She's not really French. Um, and so she gets nicknamed the shopkeeper's daughter, um, meaning like here we have this person who's not really of a religion, or excuse me, not really of a royal background. The Medicis, remember, were a merchant banking family, and so they call her the shopkeeper's daughter, being the byproduct of the Medici merchant family. Um, she was the widow of Henry II. She dominated the rule of her three rather sickly and incompetent sons. Um, you know, and remember, they, they, they're, they're taking the throne. The eldest of the son is taking the throne at a very young age. Okay, and, and so he's not going to be prepared to deal with the political issues that are going on. And Catherine de' Medici, being an adult and having some better understanding of what's happening in France at this time, is trying to kind of run the situation herself as kind of a politique of sorts. Um, but she isn't as quite as deft 
at um, being able, uh, you know, or adept at being able to, uh, you know, handle some of these affairs. And there are going to be three different noble families of significant power in France at this time that start to challenge the royal family, which has kind of been decimated by the fact that Henry II was killed in this jousting accident. You've got these three kids now. Anytime that you have children heirs, it's always going to create issues, but it's going to especially create issues when the regent of these children heirs is not liked by the French people in the first place. So these three powerful noble families are known as the Catholic Guise family, the Catholic Montmorency family, and the Huguenot Bourbon family. Okay, so these three families are of significant noble status in France, and they each start challenging the rule of the Valois dynasty, which is now in the hands of somebody who's not even really part of the Valois family. She's part of the Medici family. Um, of course, their kids, though, were considered part of the Valois dynasty, but um, not prepared to handle the religious divisions at this time. In 1560, Louis, who was the Prince of Conde, uh, and also a member of the Bourbon family, uh, planned to kidnap uh, her child, Francis II. And the Guise family, which was Catholic, ended up finding out about this, and they killed the Bourbon conspir conspirators that were going to attempt to kidnap Francis the II. And this rivalry really weakened the monarch's power because now you have these three different families who are each kind of vying for authority within the uh, within the Catholic royal family, and it doesn't look good for the Valois dynasty at this point. So uh, the Duke of Guise at this time was Francis, Duke of Guise. He's part of that Catholic noble family challenging the Valois dynasty. And in 1562, he ordered the execution of Huguenots that were worshiping on his land, and ultimately more than 3,000 Huguenots were killed in the fight. Protestant bodies of these Huguenots then get tossed into a river and their neighborhoods were burned to purify them from the heresy of the, of the uh, Calvinist faith, according to these Catholic Guise family members. And this, this began the first full-scale religious war in Europe in 1562. Um, just a year later, because of all of the bloodshed, Francis gets assassinated by a Huguenot in 1563. And um, Francis II, who was still very young at this time, dies with no heir. And so that means that now the, the younger brother of him, Charles, is going to take over as now Charles IX of France. Um, but neither he or his younger brothers have sons. And again, when you have child heirs or very young kings who don't have kids, who are looked at as being weak and sickly and heavily influenced by their mother, and other nobles, it leaves a lot of doubt in the French Valois dynasty and the future of their ability to negotiate these issues that France is having about religious wars. So here's now Charles IX, the second eldest son of Henry II, who was killed in the jousting accident. And in 1572, Charles IX agreed to provide support to Dutch Protestants despite the fact that he was Catholic who were fighting against France's rival Spain. And the reason that the Dutch Protestants were fighting against Spain is because Spain was trying to hold on to those lands in the Netherlands and control them, all right? Uh, and the Dutch are trying to break away and win their independence because remember, the Dutch have, have a different culture than the Spanish do. The Dutch have become really um, notable merchant shippers. They're very successful in trade and shipping stuff across the ocean, even being hired by other countries who would pay the Dutch merchant fleet to ship their goods for them and stuff like that. So the Dutch are starting to really make a name for themselves, and they're starting to resist Catholic Spain's rule over the Netherlands and, and break away from that. And so um, because of the political aspects of this, Charles IX actually sides against Spain, despite the fact that Spain was Catholic, in order to support the Dutch Protestants who were trying to break away, thinking to themselves, well, if the Dutch break away, we'll have our opportunity later on down the line to attack the Dutch, which the French do in the 1600s under Louis XIV. But um, at this time, they side with the Dutch to fight against the Spanish. But in the midst of this, Charles IX, being that he was easily persuadable, gets pressured by his family and by the Pope, and he actually rescinds, he renounces he renounces his support and, end, and ends up accepting direction from the very strongly Catholic House of Guise, that noble family that had been um, you know, pressuring him to, to not support the Dutch. 
And, um, you know, the, the Guise family ends up trying at that point, uh, but failing, to assassinate this leader, uh, this Protestant military uh, leader in France by the name of Admiral Gaspard de Coligny, who was a member of the Montmorency family, which was traditionally Catholic. But um, this, this guy, this uh, Admiral, de Ga or, uh, Admiral, Admiral das Gaspard de Coligny, ended up... Um, ended up converting to Huguenot, uh, to, to, to Protestant. And um, the Montmorency family, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the Catholic Guise family is trying to, to kill this guy because of his uh, conversion. And, um, you know, what ends up happening at, at this time in, in 1572 is that Charles IX's older sister, Margaret, um, ended up marrying uh, the member of the other family. So what we're really shaping up here is something called the War of the Three Henrys, and we're not quite to it yet, but we're getting there. Here's what happens. It's very almost godfather-like in, in the way that this whole thing goes down. It's very backstabbing and very, um, you know, very grim. Uh, what ends up happening is, so, you know, think about this, but let's just make sure that you understand what's happening here. Charles the Ninth, okay, who's the son of, the, the second eldest son, of Charles II, the guy that was killed in the jousting accident. Charles IX is Catholic, okay? Charles IX is Catholic. But he's being pressured by the Guise family, which is super, super, super Catholic, all right? And Charles IX's sister, Margaret, ends up marrying Henry of Navarre, who is a Huguenot, okay? And he, Henry of Navarre was part of the Bourbon dynasty, which was the third of those three families. The Guise family, the Montmorency family, and the Bourbon family were all challenging the rule of the Valois dynasty, of which Charles IX is a member. Okay? Charles IX has his sister married away to a Huguenot, okay? and, the, and the Guise family comes in and says, are you nuts? You can't allow this to happen. Um, and so what ends up happening is before his sister's wedding, Charles IX gets persuaded by his mom, Catherine de' Medici, who is, who is still around, even though Charles IX is formally of age you know, to, to reign as king, he nonetheless is still very impressionable. And so his mother and the, and the strongest Catholic Guise advisors tell him, we need to use this opportunity to strike brutally against the Huguenots. So here we have people showing up on this wedding day hoping that you know, maybe the fact that the king's sister is marrying a Huguenot, this will mean that we'll, we'll see reduced carnage in the, in the French wars of religion. But instead, they initiate this secret plot where um, on the morning of August 24th, uh, on the day of the wedding, Catholic assassins end up coming out in droves and murdering Huguenot leaders, unsuspecting Huguenot leaders, even including that admiral that they had tried to kill just recently, Admiral Gaspard de Coligny. And so he ends up being one of these successful Huguenot military leaders who gets killed in this. But for six days, Catholic mobs are storming the streets, killing 2,000 Protestants in Paris and another uh, 10,000 outside of Paris. So this is an absolute bloodbath, and it's all done kind of like a mob sort of um, plan to execute another mob family. It's really, um, it's very, very gruesome, and it results in the deaths of a whole lot of Huguenots at the hands of Catholics. Um, I mentioned, uh, or I, I said in a previous slide here, I, I may not have mentioned this yet, but just two years after that happens, um, you can't see it because it's kind of covered up by this thing up here, I guess. There it goes. Charles IX died in 1574, just two years after. And again, he dies heirless, meaning he has no kids. So now we're on the last of these three sons that Charles II, or excuse me, that Henry II had, the guy that was killed in the jousting accident. The last of the three sons, his name was Henry. So now we're finally getting to the War of the Three Henrys, as it's called. Okay, Henry III of France is the last of these three sons. Um, but he does not have any heirs because um, he is he's he is gay. Okay, to put it in a in, in the most simple of terms, historically this wouldn't have been acceptable, of course. But it's not uncommon, and we see several kings and, and so on throughout history um, that that are uh, that are homosexuals, even though it was not considered a um, tolerable practice in the faith at the time. And so um, when he gets coronated. Henry III is a very minute individual. He's very small. He's very small-featured. 
He's um, he's a very um, you know just kind of uh, you know effeminate male, and um, and the, when he they go to coronate him, which means to put the crown on his head, uh, the crown is too big for his head. It actually slips off of his head twice at coronation, which already is kind of an indicator of like where this is going. Um, and on the surface, of course, Henry the Third appeared to be devoutly Catholic, devoutly religious, but behind closed doors. Uh, ended up, you know, he was he very much enjoyed dressing up as a woman. Um, he enjoyed the company of young male courtiers in the French kingdom. Um, he was very reckless uh, with money. He spent money uh, hand over fist. He tried to raise taxes so that he could live a more glamorous lifestyle. And really, the nobility very quickly rejects him, and they resent him for not taking the position of the king seriously. Meanwhile. There are other moderate Catholics in the court at this time uh, that, that want to end the bloodshed between Catholics and Huguenots. And these are, again, politiques that are serving in high-ranking positions within the king's court surrounding Henry III. And um, hen they convince Henry III to sign an agreement with the Huguenots that would hopefully end some of this bloodshed. But not everybody in the French court was a moderate Catholic. There was still the heavy, heavy influence of the Montmorency family and the Guise family, which were radical, strong Catholics. And um, they were really angered that, that Henry III agreed to signing this, this thing with more moderate politiques in the French court to, to end the bloodshed with the Huguenots. And they want to continue, um, you know, they want to continue trying to rid France of the Huguenot presence. So these radical Catholics end up binding together in something known as the Catholic League, which now is raising up in defiance of the king's um, word to try to, you know, reduce some of the bloodshed and threaten his monarchy. So Henry III is one of these Henrys that we're going to see in this thing that goes down here. So you have Henry III, who was the king. He was part of the Valois dynasty, okay, the one I was just on on the last slide. You also now have the Duke of Guise, which is the head of the Guise family, who was also named Henry, Henry, Duke of Guise. And then now you have the head of the Bourbon dynasty, who also happens to be named Henry, and his name was Henry of Navarre. But remember, the Bourbon dynasty is the Huguenot dynasty, okay? They're, they're, they're going to be Calvinists. But Henry of Navarre is one of these politiques. Henry of Navarre, despite the fact that he is, um, he is Huguenot, the truth of the matter is that he really vacillated on his religion. He converted to and from Huguenot, back to Catholic, back to Huguenot, a number of different times in his life when he felt that it would serve him best. So he's not the most devout radical of Huguenots. He kind of sits the fence, and he uses his religious um, identification as a political tool to, um, to benefit him when the time calls for it, which is a clever thing to do during this time when you have a lot of religious fragment, fragmentation in, in France. Um, and remember, too, that he's also married to a Catholic, um, you know, a Catholic royal family member, which is the older sister of uh, both Henry III and Charles IX, who is dead now, all right, Margaret. And, and he is also technically heir to the Kingdom of France because he is married to the, the, uh, the king's sister. And so at first, Henry III and Henry of Navarre actually team up against Henry, Duke of Guise, because they're seemingly, uh, you know, there's a rightful, you know, heir to the throne in, in, in Henry of Navarre, okay? And he was married to uh, the king's sister. And so the king doesn't really, you know, initially, he kind of comes in on Henry of Navarre's side against the very, very r radically Catholic family of the Duke of Guise. Um, but then Henry III, again, because of pressure and because of being kind of weak as a king, um, switches sides. And um, I say he's weak because he's easy, easily impressionable. It has nothing to do with anything else. But he's viewed by, by others as being easily influenced. And that doesn't really make for a good king's quality when we go back to talking about, like, the prince by Machiavelli and stuff like that. Henry of Navarre made a very politique type statement where he called on tr all true French soldiers, regardless of their religion, to rally and, and come together under his leadership. And he's actually very successful in doing so. So by 1587, Henry of Navarre had actually defeated both the King and the Catholic League 
uh, which the Guise family was a part of. But at that time, he doesn't take that opportunity. Henry III wasn't killed in that. He defeats him, but he doesn't kill him. And he doesn't take the throne. Oddly enough, at that point, Henry doesn't seem, Henry of Navarre doesn't seem that interested in being king. He kind of walks away from the battle. He actually walks away from the battle because there's another woman that he was seeing on the side that he wanted to go and hang out with. So he's like, ah, I'm kind of good. I don't really want to be king right now. I'd rather go and kind of pursue my own individual uh, interests and stuff. And so even after Henry III and uh, Henry the Duke of Guise, which were part of the Catholic League, even after they had been defeated, Henry of Navarre kind of sits on it and he says, ah, I'm good. I don't want to be king right now. Henry III can keep being king. So um, in 1588, Spain is defeated in uh, the Spanish Armada, which was when, I don't know if you read about it in your book. We didn't talk about it much in the lecture, but just to briefly recap on the Spanish Armada, what it was, was where um, in England at this time, Elizabeth is the Queen of England, and um, Elizabeth had been hiring a guy by the name of Francis Drake and a number of other, uh, basically, we call them privateers. And what that basically means is pirates who have been hired by the state to go and do state-sanctioned piracy on the seas and steal from other kingdoms' um, shipments. And um, Elizabeth I was very good friends with this guy named Sir Francis Drake. And Sir Francis Drake was one of these pirates, one of these privateers who had been hired by the Queen of England to go and raid Spanish ships and steal their shipments from them. And um, when the Spanish king, Philip II, found out about this, remember Philip II had actually previously been married to um, Elizabeth's older half-sister, Ma Bloody Mary, Mary I, and he had actually wanted to marry Elizabeth, and she kept on rejecting him. So for both personal and political reasons, when Philip II finds out that Elizabeth has been sanctioning um, pirates, privateers, to go and steal their stuff, their silver in particular, he's like, well, we're not going to tolerate that. We're Spain. We're going to attack England. And so Spain takes every ship that floats and sends it up to, um, to England to attack England and hopefully invade and take over England. But with all of that money that Elizabeth had been stealing for about two or three decades from um, from Spain. She was using that money to build her own English Royal Navy. And so when the Spanish ships sail up there, first of all, they go through a giant storm. One of the storms of the century, when they hit the Bay of Biscay, it's really, really rough sailing. And a lot of the ships, you know, their masts are broken from storms. It's just really, really rough sailing all the way up to England. So they're already hurting by the time that they get up there from this torrential storm that they run into. But then they get there and they realize, OMG, the, uh, the English have a lot more boats than we thought that they did. And the English boats, even though they were smaller than the, French, or than the uh, Spanish galleons that got sent up there, um, the English boats were more maneuverable, they were faster, and um, the English sailors had you know, some degree of you know, uh, you know, sailing acumen to be able to uh, decimate the remaining uh, Spanish forces. And so the Spanish Armada goes down as a catastrophe in Spanish history. It fails miserably. And from that point on, Spain is really going to see its power dwindle in Europe as a product of really just expanding way too far for its own ability to administer its territories in the New World and as a product of their uh, navy being decimated by the English after the Spanish Armada. But after 1588, Spain got defeated by England and Spain no longer backs the Henry Duke of Guise anymore. Uh, after the Spanish fall in this, they're like, we got to tend to our own affairs. We can't be helping out the French with their little religious problems anymore. And Henry Duke of Guise gets assassinated, okay, by Henry III's bodyguards in December of 1588. And this revived the Catholic League's revolts against Henry III because now they look at Henry III as a traitor to the Catholic cause after Henry III's bodyguards killed Henry Duke of Guise, who was this really, really strong Catholic. And at that point, now Henry III has no choice but to ally with Henry of Navarre uh, of the Bourbon family. And he, remember, even though he's, he's a Calvinist or a Huguenot, Henry III has to ally with Henry of Navarre. And um, ultimately, just a year later, a Catholic monk manages to assassinate Henry III in 1589. And um, immediately, Henry III's bodyguards turn around and swear their allegiance to Henry of Navarre, the, the guy who was the rightful heir to the throne in the first place and who had already defeated the Catholic League. 
And so Henry then, um, you know, basically rallies the forces and, and that he had uh, rallied before. He beats the Catholic League a second time in 1589 and 90. And in 1593, um, in order to become king of France, he says, well, France is worth a mass. Meaning, if it means, you know, because basically what people said was, look, the only way you're becoming the king of France is if you convert to Catholicism. And it's not really what he wants to do. But again, being that he's not super um, hardcore either way in terms of his religious beliefs, he basically says, look, if it, if it takes me converting to Calvinism, or excuse me, me con, uh, converting to Catholicism, renouncing my Huguenot beliefs, and attending Mass on Sunday for the future and safety of France, then I'll do it. And he, he converts to Catholicism in 1593, and he becomes Henry IV of France, also sometimes called Good King Henry, or Henry IV, the Good King. And in, uh, but not everybody's happy with this. Remember, France still has a lot of re devout Catholics across the country, and some of them in very high positions. And so um, they're going to make several attempts against Henry IV. Um, and, and he survives actually nine separate assassination attempts uh, and in, it, you know, does some things while he's able to survive. First of all, in 1596, he convinced the, the Assembly of Notables, which were some of the most powerful nobles in France, to approve an additional tax called the Paulette, which ensured that office holders, um, that their title would be uh, passed down to an heir via an annual payment. Um, he also, um, in other words, they would basically pay a tax yearly to ensure that their title would be passed down and recognized to their heirs. In 1598, the most important thing that Henry IV Henry of Navarre, Henry the Good King of France does. And remember, this initiates a brand new dynasty in France because Henry III was assassinated by that monk. That's the end of the Valois dynasty. And we now see the Bourbon dynasty take over in France and it would remain in power for a good long time. And so in 1598, Henry IV passes something called the Edict of Nantes. And the Edict of Nantes made Catholic Catholicism the official religion of France, but at the same time granted two million Huguenots, Protestants, in a population of two and a half, or 18 and a half million, which is a pretty significant minority, the right to worship at home, hold religious services, and have schools even in some places. So this is a grant of religious toleration to Huguenots, despite the fact that he is still saying that the Catholic Church will be the official religion of France, okay? And, um, you know, he, uh, he survives nine assassination attempts, but they didn't stop there. And on the 10th assassination attempt, he is killed. And, um, you know, Henry IV, before he dies, he's, he's king for about 20 years, and he really does a very good job because he made the French monarchy more powerful by dispensing privileges, dispensing favors to people, dispensing money and earning people's political authority and using a royal privy council, very similar to when we talked about um, Henry VII of England, okay, Henry Tudor, who created the Court of Star Chamber, which was this inner privy council that would um, manage the king's affairs and stuff like that, like a group of close-knit counselors that the ministers that the king trusted. Henry IV does the same thing in France at this time. And much of his centralizing success also came because he put smart people in power, in particular a guy by the name of Maximilien de Bethune, and he was the Minister of Finance for Henry IV. Sometimes they call him Duke of Sully, okay, that's his other title. So the Duke of Sully, Maximilien de Bethune, is really good at French budget keeping, bookkeeping, um, creating a nice, efficient fiscal tax collection system for France, keeping the state uh, economically viable. Uh, he also, Henry IV, also encouraged manufacturing silk and tapestries in France, and he even invested in creating canal construction to increase trade in France, meaning that these are man-made rivers that would be able to connect different places together. France notoriously had a very stifled um, trade system. It was very difficult to trade across the French countryside because all the different nobles had different tariffs and taxes and tolls and other things like that and that made shipping in France very, very expensive. But in 1610, uh, on a fateful day in Paris where uh, the king's carriage was stuck in traffic because at that time Paris was a very 
uh, medieval town still, and the, and the roads were very narrow, and, and it was very uh, um, congested. He gets stuck in traffic, and a, and a religious radical monk, Catholic monk, um, entered into the king's uh, carriage and stabbed him three times and kills him. Uh, and, and that is the end of Henry IV's rule of France. The next king to take over in France was his son, who was still not fully grown yet. Um, so he is only eight years old when he was crowned king, and he was, a, he was, again, under the leadership of a regent, this time Marie de' Medici, okay? And, um, and so that's the one who's kind of running the show until he comes of age. But Louis XIII is going to be the next king of France, and um, he's stubborn, he's extremely high-strung, very, very nervous, anxious-style personality. Also, he was severely beaten as a child, um, which meant that he was, you know, traumatized as a kid. He ends up marrying an Austrian princess, and again, she's looked at as a foreigner. They don't really get along that well. The French people don't care much for her. And he ends up producing an heir in 1638, but it's, he, he, lives a, he lives a troubled life. This is a guy who was super intelligent. Louis XIII, it was not for lack of brains uh, that, that his reign goes down as, as um, uh, somewhat you know, brutal because he, he's just, he's, he's on a hair trigger. He's ready to explode at any time. And um, he actually, during his time, en ends up ordering more execution than any other French monarch in history. And so he's really a very tyrannical ruler, uh, Louis XIII is, kind of as a byproduct of his pretty brutal upbringing. He also hires smart people, though, in his inner council. Uh, Cardinal Richelieu, for example, is a very, very um, big name that you should know in French uh, history. Cardinal Richelieu expanded the administrative authority of Louis XIII and the fiscal reach of the crown and, and ended up increasing uh, taxes substantially. And Cardinal Richelieu, despite being a clergy member, is again one of these guys who uses politique, this approach to foreign and domestic affairs, and perfected political survival. So Cardinal Richelieu is a very important French administer serving Louis XIII, who allows Louis XIII to continue to centralize his reign. And this is something we'll talk more about when we get into the age of absolutism in Unit 4. But Louis XIII and his regent, Marie de' Medici, um, began using a system known as the intendance system. Intendants were kind of middling class people, middling class officials, who were overseen by the king's council. These are kind of a bureaucratic group of people who were given positions within the government to serve the king and his directed ministers within his inner circle. And they were responsible to the king, and they weren't responsible to other nobles, which meant that these intendants were kind of um, these, these king's officials who came from lesser-born backgrounds, but no less had a lot of authority to make nobles follow the king's rules. And of course, the nobles don't like that because they, should, they see themselves as the people who should be being put into positions of power, not these lesser-born intendants. And so what this is doing is it's creating a barrier between the high-ranking nobles in France and the king and his officials. And so this centralizes his authority and it reduces the power of high nobles in distant regions of France. And remember that France being a huge area um, in Europe at this time, is it's really difficult for the king to central his, centralize his authority over distant um, nobles who live in the far western regions or far southern regions of France who had been used to a fair degree of independence and autonomy and running things how they want to run them in their little corner of France. Um, but with Richelieu's help, Cardinal Richelieu helps to establish the beginnings of absolutism in France with uh, Louis XIII as king. He also reversed his mother's pro-Spain policy and ended up actually opposing the Catholic Habsburgs in the Thirty Years' War and supporting, for political reasons, the Huguen uh, excuse me, the, um, the Protestants in, in the Thirty Years' War. Uh, but again, kind of a short-lived king. Louis XIII only lives to the age of 42 as he dies from tuberculosis in 1643, shortly before the end of the Thirty Years' War in Europe. So Louis XIII is the king of France for much of the Thirty Years' War. And that, friends, 
is where we are going to leave off for today. A couple of quick things that I was going to mention to you before I sign off is that I have a couple. Remember that we have a test on Friday. Friday is the day of the test. We are getting pretty close to the end of this unit here. Um, for today's assignment, I have started to put up some review practice quizzes for you. Um, uh, that will go back and talk over some of the different, cover some of the things that we've already talked about. We've got two already assigned today, and then there will be another, uh, actually there will be three assigned today, and then there will be another three assigned on Wednesday. And remember that for these quizzes, you have three attempts to do them. You don't just have to settle on the first score that you, can get, that you get. You can do them again. Beware on the matching one not to trust the score that you get on that, as I will have to go and manually put the scores in on cue. If you get even one term wrong on the matching one, it's gonna say that you got the whole thing wrong, but don't freak out because I'll make sure to go through and give you the proper score on it. Um, and, then, um, and then what else is, oh, um, uh, don't forget too, I'm trying to stay as best I can on top of grades, but with people turning in late assignments in all of my classes, um, it makes it really hard to go back and figure out who's handed in what because there's a lot of assignments and a lot of different people who hand in a lot of different late assignments. I made a post that if you didn't see it, I really would like you to go on there and respond to it on Canvas. Go on to Canvas, go to the announcements section. Last Thursday, I made a post asking people to respond to it. If there's an assignment, I need you to look over your own grade. If there's an assignment that you know you handed in, but you don't yet have a score for it, whether you handed it in late or you handed it in and I couldn't access the file or whatever reason, I would like you to go on and respond to that so that I can organize by class um, who is missing what and attend to those affairs and make sure that your grade is nice and updated as we continue to move throughout the semester. So if you could please go and do that if you know that there's something that you've been waiting to be added to the grade book, please do just go on and respond to the post that I made on Canvas so that I can see you know, what the assignment is and who's missing it and stuff like that without having to search through a bazillion emails or Canvas messages um, you know, to, to find whatever you're missing, okay? Because that takes up a lot of time and it's difficult to do. So uh, please do go on and do that if you're, if you're waiting for an assignment to be added that you handed in late. Okay, uh, for that, folks, uh, thank you so much for, uh, for tuning in today. And um, if you want attendance, just make sure that you log into Canvas today and I'll make sure to get that taken care of. All right, have a great day, and we'll see you back on Wednesday.